Hi, I'm Thomas Broadhead. I'm the editor of the Critical Performance Edition of the Ives Fourth Symphony. And in this video, I'm going to talk about my work with the BBC Symphony in 2015, which was a great year for that work. Um, the three times I spent a week with an orchestra rehearsing um, the edition for a, a public performance. And uh, in the spring of that year, I was contacted by Mark Millage, who is the orchestra librarian of the BBC Symphony. And he told me that when they had done the edition the previous, uh, the previous fall in September of 2014, that it had been a great experience for everyone. They, they had enjoyed it so much that they decided to do it again, almost a year to the date, um, at the proms. And uh, he also wanted me to speak about the edition at the MOLA conference in Montreal that May. MOLA is the Major Orchestra Librarians Association, and, and he that year was the president. And he said that when he had gotten the edition the previous year uh, and had flipped through the front matter and come to the checklist for the orchestra library, and he just was blown away and <laughs> that there, he had never encountered an edition that had attended to that particular detail before. And it helped him you know, just immensely. And so he invited me to give this 50 minute long talk, which I did. And the talk itself in Montreal was not recorded. Um, uh, but what I did once I got back home was to recreate the talk and film myself doing it. And then I posted it to, up, uh, to YouTube. So it is available for anyone to listen through. And what I did for the talk was I made these booklets um, which I'll show you. And here it is, a booklet titled From A Priori to A Posteriori, a new edition of the Ives Fourth Symphony with real world feedback. Um, and that's, that was the title of a talk that I gave. And inside of this booklet are um, the State of the Survival Guide as it existed in 2015, other essays from the front matter, and then music examples. And um, I made th these booklets myself. There were about 35 of them I think I made all together. And I had to work out uh, the imposing, uh, as it's called, uh, which is how, the calculation of uh, which page goes on which sheet when you're doing like a double sheet that's going to be folded and then stapled, you know, because if you don't work it out and figure out what needs to be printed where, then nothing comes out in the right place. Um, and so that's its own fun little math problem. But there were more people than there were booklets, so many people were having to share the booklets, and I don't know who all ended up with one, but they're unique items. <laughs> I think this is the only one I have left. Um, but uh, the, my, my talk was not the text that's found inside of the booklet. The booklet glosses the talk, uh, the, the talk I'd written out separately. And so uh, this is then the basis of the YouTube video that I subsequently uh, created and uploaded. The video is a reproduction of the lecture and where I used an electronic form of the, the booklet that I handed out to illustrate everything that I'm describing in the, in the text of the lecture. Um, and here, there's a, a link to the video on my Ives Fourth Symphony site. And the site itself is mainly a reproduction of the survival guide with illustration. Uh, this was assembled before the score went into print and I thought it would be handy for people to be able to access this online and read it on their mobile devices and so on. And I got permission from AMP Shermer you know, to, to include all the articles and so on. And so the easiest way to find the MOA talk is probably just to go to the site and go to resources. And under the resources tab, there's a section with videos and uh, this video is, is one of them. So again, that talk was in May of 2015. And then in September of that year, I traveled to London to spend a week with the BBC Symphony as they prepared for their performance of the work at the proms, uh, which was almost a year to the date of their 2014 performance, which had been at the Barbican, um, both times under Andrew Lytton. And the BBC S Symphony is constantly playing music for, you know, they're having to record music for the BBC. So they're constantly sight reading new music. So sight reading is no issue for them whatsoever. And uh, sight reading Ives 
is no issue either. They can do it really, really well. And they gave it a just a crackerjack performance. Um, and I also had confirmation that the evolving viola edit covered in a previous video was actually, you know, uh, working out just as I had ho hoped and planned. So here's the viola part we discussed in a previous video. And it's that thorny section in the comedy movement where during a, a, a little fantasy on Camptown races that's being played in, by the clarinet and the solo piano, we have this umpa, 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 umpa rhythm that's going on between the cellos and the violas. And the problem initially was that the violas couldn't figure out whether or not they were aligned with the cellos. And by putting in this rhythm cue, it made it obvious that they were not to be playing with them. Um, but it wasn't helping them figure out where their beats were to fit uh, when they weren't playing along with the cellos. And, but by putting in this footnote at the bottom, showing it's just a oompa, 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 oompa uh, pattern, it clarified everything. And one of the players with the viola section came up to me and said, thank you for putting this in. This helped so much. And in fact, when Andrew Lytton rehearsed the cellos and violas separately from the rest of the orchestra on this passage, they were able to do it in the very first try. It, there was no issue. They just got it. And talk about something being music you know, to your ears, right? One of the other things that I got confirmation about with the BBC was the helpfulness of the counting numbers and the fourth movement, the, those numbers that are you know, correlative with the slash marks that players will place above the measures in their parts to indicate where the beat units are. Um, and I, I was not the one who came up with the idea of putting them in. The idea behind the counting numbers came from a different editor, Alan Edwards. Alan is probably best known for this work, Flawed Words and Stubborn Sounds. It's a transcription of a series of conversations he had with Elliot Carter around 1970. Um, the title is a, a line from a Wallace Stevens poem. And he was the editor I interfaced with when I was working on Carter pieces uh, for Boozy and Hawks. And he was such an incredibly thorough proofreader um, that it just, it, he just blew me away. He had this very uh, precise methodology that he followed and the order in which he checked for items and that kind of thing. And I thought when I got to the, the Ives uh, and the parts, I thought, you know, I, I've got to bring him into the fold. He needs to... Uh, give some feedback. And so I got him to proofread the parts to the fourth movement. That's all the time he had in his schedule. Um, and he was the one who suggested, you know, the putting in the counting numbers and had written them into the parts when he, he proofread them. And this was all back in like 2010. And at first I was taken aback by them, but he said, no, 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 you know, players will be marking in slash marks in their parts anyway to indicate where the beat units are. So you might as well write in these numbers, it'll just, you know, it'll expedite the parsing of the measures for the players. I said, okay, I'll, let, let's do it then. And so no one uh, complained about them. And the few people that I spoke with, you know, about them, you know, seemed to find no issue with them initially. And then I got to one set of rehearsals where I approached the assistant concert master of an orchestra I won't mention. And she said, oh, you know, the part is fine, but, you know, these counting numbers, this is just too much. You know, the, let us do this. This is our job, not yours. I thought, okay, well, thank you. I, mean, I thanked her for that. And I thought, well, maybe, maybe Alan was wrong. You know, maybe I should strip these things out. Um, after that concert, the end of that week, I was walking down the steps from the concert hall, and I saw next to me was one of the violinists from... Uh, that very same violin section. And I said, you know, congratulations on the great, great performance tonight. Uh, let me ask you something. What do you think about the counting numbers and the fourth movement? And he said, Oh, thank you. Those were so helpful. Those really helped out. I really appreciate you putting them in. It made it easier to parse those large measures. I'm like, okay, thank you. You know, that's exactly what I needed to hear. So from within the same orchestra, players within the same section were giving me contradictory feedback about the utility of, of the counting numbers. Well, um, I had confirmation that it's probably, you know, good that they're in. It was further to that coming from the BBC and the solo pianist who uh, performed with them. 
the solo pianist was William Wolfram. And when I asked him about the music and you know his part, he said, oh, let me tell you something. And I didn't even prompt him about this. He just went to it directly. He said, those counting numbers in the last movement, they're very helpful. You even put in a plus symbol at the end of that confounding six and a half two measure that shows that there's an extra beat at the end that you have to count before going into the measure that follows. Thank you for doing that. That's that just made it so helpful. I thought, great. This is exactly um, what I needed to hear. You know, the, this work uh, that I've done is actually, you know, helpful to, uh, to, to, to players. Now, it regards, you know, the, um, the, the criticism I got from that one violinist, you know, you, you can please some of the people some of the time, but you can't pl please all the people all the time. And I didn't want to create a vanity edition that would only serve, you know, certain players and certain orchestras. I was trying to come up with the greatest good for the greatest number. And so there, you know, may be some overkill in the way that I'm trying to, you know, parse things for the players and so on in places. But just because it may seem like too much to one player, it could be um, just right, or maybe not, maybe even not enough for another player. So I think it's best to err on the side of caution in these things. And on, on the balance, I, I discovered that like what I had done really, really was helping out. 